those who were uh, who are not here, we've had our first hearing session this morning, uh, which was theme A, which was mostly looking at the quality uh, of care in London, of health and healthcare in London. And uh, this afternoon, we're moving to the third theme, which is theme D, uh, which is in relation to the health and wealth of London. This is an extremely important theme for London. Uh, I think we made the case this morning. Uh, London is in a unique position globally when it comes to the life sciences industry. Uh, the economic contribution of the life sciences industry towards London's economy, but also the national economy, is extremely important. And at the same time, it also fits in with the, uh, the health and well-being agenda and its economic impact on uh, on London itself, but uh, also how do you make London attractive to, uh, to the life sciences industry as far as investments is concerned, uh, having three major universities in London that competes globally, how do you translate that science uh, into evidence base through the National Health Service in London, but also how do you translate that evidence base into clinical practice, which is becoming more and more challenging. So in many ways encompasses many of very important contributions, including some that the mayor is leading on, like Met City in London, the creation uh, of the three academic health sciences uh, uh, centers, uh, and the renewal recently, but also the creation of the academic health sciences network dealing with population health, which is an area which touched on uh, this morning. And we have a a, uh, a very distinguished panel with us today uh, who are uh, who have agreed and thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, uh, to to lead uh, this uh, important uh, discussion uh, we have uh, Peter Ellingworth who is the chief executive of the Association of British Healthcare Industries ABHI an organization that I've had a long association with and thank you Peter for being here, but more importantly, Peter is also chairing this theme. So Peter is going to put the the outputs of this theme together. And uh, on my left, we have uh, Chris Strether, who is the managing director of the South London Academic Health Sciences Network. Uh, Chris is uh, not new to reform in London. I think uh, we worked together in 2006, where he led one of the pathways of care, the acute care. And uh, delighted you here, Chris. And then finally, uh, uh, Professor David Fish, who is the Managing Director of UCL Partners. And uh, David has played a, a huge role in uh, transforming the health economy in that part of London, but also played a significant leadership role in really driving the whole agenda of uh, the academic and sciences centres, but more recently the academic and sciences network. If I'm correct, David, you wear both of those hats. Uh, which puts you in a very unique position. So there are uh, uh, our panel, and I think if I could go straight to our, do we have a our first witness? Or oh, there we are. Oh, so, sorry, I did not. Uh, our first witness is Dr. Uh, Bina Rawal. I'm very grateful for your time and for being here. Uh, uh, you have a. Uh, an amazing CV, but all of that is on the website to save time because we really want to spend most of our time having a, an interactive discussion with you. Uh, your CV is on the website, so anyone could have access to. So thank you for being here. You probably are fully aware of what we're trying to do. And, uh, and I just thought maybe you can share with us some of your thoughts in relation to this commission. What we're looking for really is ideas, uh, whether these are you know, policy ideas, what makes a difference that we can include in this very important commission? Certainly. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'd just like to start off by thanking the commission for this invitation and the opportunity to present um, evidence to you today. Um, I'd just like to say that um, I, I've been at the ABPI as Research Medical Innovation Director for just over a year, but um, maybe in some of my responses I will blend in my experience from having worked at the Wellcome Trust and also within uh, two big pharma companies, as well as in the NHS and in academia. So 
I suppose um, my perspectives uh, can can come from any one of those different sectors. So uh, maybe I'll preface my remarks each time they do. Um, so the ABPI, just to set the scene, is the leading um, trade association for the research-based biopharmaceutical industry in the UK. Um, we have approximately 55 to 60 full members and about 20 research affiliates and uh, probably another 60 or so um, general affiliates. And of the members, about 20 have sites in London, in the, in the London AHS regions, I should say. And these are by and large headquarter sites as opposed to research sites or manufacturing sites. So just also uh, by way of overview in terms of the pharmaceutical industry's contribution um, in the UK, we invest uh, around £4.2 billion annually in research and development, representing a quarter of all R&D investment from all companies. And uh, this brings in a trade surplus of £5 billion, and it also results in direct employment of over 70,000 people. Um, and of all the medical research and, uh, that's funded in the UK, it's about 60% is uh, commercially funded. And of all the medicines supplied to the NHS, ABPI members account for about 90% of those. So um, having set that sort of high-level overview of where the ABPI sits, uh, I also want to add that we work very, very closely indeed with the Department of Health, the NHS, the research funders, academic institutions, and many, many other stakeholders um, to try to help build a world-leading environment for R&D here in the UK. And um, we believe that collaborative working across all those sectors is actually the fundamental key to achieving what we're all trying to achieve. So um, with that sort of intro, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, well, le let me start first. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, we're trying to make London as a global leader in the life sciences industry. and uh, And... You know, if you see what's happening in Boston, in San Francisco, in Shanghai and others, a number of your members are making significant investments in there. Uh, and I wanted to get your thoughts and your views. Uh, you know, London is historically has led uh, and had many, many manufacturing, but also research and development labs here. You know, what, what could this commission do to increase that activity in London? Uh, considering that there are some national, not constraint, but there's some significant amount of reform has already happened in terms of the patent box, in terms of all sorts of other uh, stimulus that has been put at a national level. But the uniqueness of London having uh, the three universities, the three academic health sciences centres, what do you think this commission could do to enhance the bit or even accelerate uh, interest and investments in London? I think um, if we look at it in the broad context of the UK life science strategy, uh, which was launched in December 2011, yeah. um, lots of inroads have been made. And uh, if you also then expand that to look at innovation, health and wealth, um, there are many aspects of both those um, uh, overarching strategies that have been able to be delivered particularly well. And uh, there are other areas where progress has been slow or stagnated. And so I think that it's important to examine where we are with both innovation, health and wealth and the life science strategy. Um, and all four trade associations, actually, ABH, IABPI, BIFTA and um, BIA, are launching a document which does... Uh, such a, a review of the current state of play and that's going to be launched on Thursday and we'd we'll be happy to sort of pass that on to the Commission. Um, uh, so I think that it's important in the context of that to look at the strengths that exist in London where London can play a, a leading role in helping to advance uh, not only the overall strategy but also investment into London. So um, it, there is uh, London is blessed with a very diverse population, so I think that's a major strength. 
Uh, with the three AHSNs, it's probably around about 10 million people. And uh, so not only is this a population that's diverse in terms of nationalities, there's a good spread of age groups and a good spread of uh, morbidities and many comorbidities as well. So a lot of the investments that have been made in recent times in e-health, for example, um, can be leveraged to be able to really um, uh, understand the morbidities and mortality and patient outcomes and pathways, as well as use the information, the health information from these populations to understand the disease biology. So if you look all the way through the whole value chain from drug discovery, particularly with the 100,000 <coughs> genomes uh, program and gen Genomics England having been set up, there is a massive potential to build on the technology and the information that we have to be able to, to uh, use the data through link appropriate linkages under appropriate safeguards for patient privacy and confidentiality to feed into R&D, to feed into stratified medicines, to feed into translational research, to feed into late-stage clinical research, so, so the CPRD okay. is um, an, another major resource that can contribute to the delivery of investment in clinical trials, and also uh, observational trials, real-world data trials. So uh, going across the whole value chain from disease biology, target identification, stratification, personalized medicine, translation, into clinical trials, real-world data, and then ultimately into um, how those medicines are used medicines optimization, pharmacovigilance safety, across the value chain, the, the data can be leveraged. Okay. It just, just maybe later on, or you mm -hmm. can send me some, you, you know, what will make your members specifically in, come to London, invest in London, and set up shop in London, is the question that I'm asking. So if you can think about that, it doesn't have to mm -hmm. be today, but sometime in the future, I really will appreciate that. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be, I mean, we have a number of national strategies, I agree with that, but we're trying to figure out what is unique about London through your membership and what London could do to enhance and facilitate mm -hmm. that. So could I start with, with Peter? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Peter, that was a good exposition of the landscape there. And mm -hmm. I think um, to build on what Ara's just asked, with your experience, what would it take for that significant investment we're already getting from big pharma companies in the UK to really increase it significantly, to have great ambition for using London. What would it take in London to really attract them? Well, London already has um, the um, excellent academic institutions, but there's going to be an increasing requirement for skills that specifically feed into the agenda for the life science sector, particularly pharmaceutical companies. And talking to our own members, the, the skills that um, they point out to us are, are particularly um, going to potentially present a problem are skills in the areas of in vivo sciences, such as pharmacology, toxicology, veterinary pathology, clinical pharmacology and experimental medicine in general, the, uh, also bioinformatics, data mining, mathematical biology and modelling and health economics and health outcomes and modelling. So the ABPI has been looking at the skills agenda um, and working very closely with the Sector Skills Council, COGENT, mm -hmm. um, and we are about to launch a survey actually across uh, sectors, not just to our members, to actually su survey them currently as to what they believe um, should be the focus for in improving our skills base. And um, there is a bid going through currently through uh, via Cogent to the um, UK Commission of Employment and Skills, um, which will be a, a science industry partnership bid which will mean that employers could drive um, the programs that would be generated through that um, money to set up apprenticeships and whatever else they felt was going to fill the skills gap. 
So I think skills is one area. And then I think the other area is around um, new ways of working. So the academic health science networks are relatively new. Um, but what they have been able to do is uh, really um, increase the level of engagement, not, it, not just in terms of quantity and frequency, but also the quality of that engagement. And um, it's also resulted in a recognition for the need to adopt innovation. And it's also been able to really focus down on um, how to get clinical research, commercial clinical research done at scale to time and to target. And I think the NIHR has done very well. And um, we're told that the latest statistics for NIHR, from NIHR for commercial trials, are that they've had 20 and a half thousand patients into commercial clinical trials in the last year. And 20 global firsts, which means the first patient recruited into a global study was in the UK. And the median time for all the NHS permissions to be through is now 28 days. And 63% um, and of all NIHR commercial studies are recruiting to time and target, which is doubling from recent times. So I think that um, that's good news, and the AHSNs uh, have worked very closely to uh, ensure that that uh, continues to improve. And what we can do as industry is convey that information back into companies and into the global headquarters where decisions are made about where to invest so um, that that um, success doesn't um, you know, uh, lose traction for future. Um, the other area is around um, adoption of the innovation. So the AHSNs clearly are trying to um, identify and create adoption and spread of innovation through linkages and levers that they can use. Um, but you know, in order to do cutting edge research, uh, you need the cutting edge medicines to be actually being used. So if you can't do a clinical trial here because the comparator is, even though it's NICE approved, isn't actually being used by patients, then th that would mean that the trial wouldn't happen here. So those sorts of factors would play into it. And I think that other areas such as regulatory innovation, which was promoted through the UK life science um, strategy, um, some of it has stagnated. So the early access scheme was uh, ready to be launched, but no funding was associated with it. So that's uh, a little bit uncertain what's happening with that. Um, and lots of conversations went on about adaptive licensing um, with the Center for the Advancement of uh, Sustainable Medical Innovation, CASME. Again, um, we need to accelerate the pace and actually put in place some um, activities that try to pilot and demonstrate these initiatives. So both on big data, on regulatory innovation, adaptive licensing, and um, getting more um, data through on adoption and metrics, I think it's putting it all into practice that's taking time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions <coughs> from this side? Yeah, just um, briefly, Bina, you've I think you've described very well a change in attitude, I think, both from the health service and from pharma, which is, you know, laudable and, and hopefully will turn into something. What, what, what I call out here is, is, is there anything in terms of what you might want from, from us in terms of very practical things that we might change that would allow this kind of goodwill to be turned into action, which improved outcomes for patients and created wealth? Certainly, I think that um, more movement of people across the sectors would help bridge some of these mm. cultural divides. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, having been in different sectors myself, there is a very um, distinct culture um, in each of those sectors to this day. 
Um, secondly, I think that um, the areas of strengths and weaknesses need to be um, recognised and, and accepted. So when um, industry and academic partnerships are set up, sometimes, uh, you know, the, uh, in the academic side may be weak on project management or PKPD modelling or, you know, some such yeah. thing, or toxicology or interpretation of certain things, and vice versa, the uh, company may be weak on the biology and really the, the, the rationale and the scientific basis of such an approach. So it's good to be able to blend those and to maximise and build on each other's strengths and weaknesses, whereas um, it's unhelpful to really just end up um, the, the discussion stagnating because people don't reach agreement. And I think by having people who've worked on both sides of the fence, it's very helpful to appreciate those differences. Thank you. David, do you have one? I'd like to ask you three questions, one on trajectory, one on talent, and one on London to do with the rest of the UK. You started by giving some figures uh, in relation to the whole country, 4.2 billion for R&D, 5 billion for trade. Could I just um, push you a bit on that and say, do you have figures or could you supply them to the Commission on trajectory? Because what we want to see is a change in trajectory. If that was the mo if that's sort of the most recent figures, presumably for the UK, then it would be very good to understand the trajectory. Has it been declining and at what rate over the last few years? Has it plateaued out? So that we could know what a change would look like. And then as a sort of mm -hmm. subset of that as to whether you've got the data for London. So because I think if we can't track it, it's very difficult to develop mm -hmm. it. The mm -hmm. second question, which is related to that, is we've obviously talked about London, but from your sector's point of view, I'm very keen to understand how London can relate to work with the rest of the country. And so this is in no way London competing with the rest of the country, but London working with the rest of the country, producing wealth, uh, wealth nationally. And the third question is about talent. You talked about skills. I sort of will relentlessly focus on what can we do better from your perception together to develop the very top end of talent that is globally competitive. Uh, there's a, you know, the 100% of the skills market, there's a top 1% to 2% in science that is so important. And is your perception that we're gathering pace on that top 1% or 2% or losing ground on that 1% or 2% at the top? So three questions. Mm -hmm. Well, on the first question, unfortunately, I don't have that data to hand. Um, I'd have to go back and talk to colleagues, including in the Office of Health Economics, to see if they have been tracking it and would be able to provide something. So we'd, I'd follow up with you on that subsequently. Both for the country and for London? Would yes, be very... I'll, I'll certainly ask that question to colleagues, yes. Um, in terms of London and the rest of the UK, I think that... Um, in a way, the um, AHSNs are beginning to highlight that um, it's important to balance competition with collaboration so that um, there may be areas where um, a few AHSNs can productively work on something because they, ha they have the same deliverables or the same outcomes that they're aiming at versus um, certain things where actually they, they have a, a leading academic health science centre and can actually compete on uh, rather than try to collaborate. So uh, I'm not sure if that's where your question was going in terms of connecting with the rest of the uh, country. There were two sorts, two sorts of connections. Mm -hmm. Obviously a connection with Oxford and Cambridge, but mm -hmm. if you're in your industry sitting in New York and you look at the UK, I realise it looks a very small place on the map. And I just mm -hmm. wonder how much there's a differentiation between in, in the my, in the perception between London, the South East and, and the UK and what could we do that would support across the country? What just one thing mm -hmm. could we do to help? I mean as you say looking uh, from global headquarters that are based outside of the UK um, you know 
the UK does already punch above its weight because 9% of investment comes here versus less than 3% of global sales. Um, and it is the academic excellence um, that I've heard repeated many times that is a draw to, to the UK and, and to London and the, the so-called golden triangle with Oxford, Cambridge and London. Um, that, so if that's, that, if that's the key driver, how do we do better on the 1% or 2% right at the top to get the talent in uh, in the trainee era? The, I think that's one element. Um, for example, at the Wellcome Trust, um, they had uh, instituted um, investigator awards uh, as opposed to project grants, and that was a big shift for them, I remember, when I was there. And I don't know uh, whether that has actually uh, um, been enhancing that agenda of, of uh, building preeminent science and, and, and scientists and investigators and that Nobel Prize winning top 1% that you speak of. Um, but also I think um, it's around having um, clusters and proximity between multidisciplines and uh, because I think healthcare uh, in the future is going to require much more interdisciplinary working. Um, you know, one's going to see um, situations where you have a screening test, you have an app for monitoring something, you have a, a test for diagnosing the genetic bi biomarker, you have the medicine aimed at a particular um, you know, uh, genetic mutation, and then you have a, a test for monitoring response to the treatment. And so you, you need to marry up all of those things and progress them uh, in a way that's going to deliver better outcomes for patients as well as uh, enable all of those players to commercialise their, um, their science and their technology. And so I think that's going to be um, much more productive in an environment where you have uh, clusters where people are in proximity to a range of talents. So greater interdisciplinarity. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Bina. I mean, could I just touch on that last question? I've been working with industry all my life, and this question always comes up you know, 9% investment of R&D and a 3% sales. The UK population, just to always remind ourselves, we're little England. Uh, the UK population mm -hmm. is less than 0.88%, so it's less than 1% of the global population. So, however, on the other hand, I think there are, you know, I think there are wonderful opportunities of accelerating the adoption of certain uh, technologies and medicines. So. But if I could leave you with this note, we are desperately keen in this commission to find out as much as possible from your members what could London do, what could this London Commission do to accelerate investment and also uptake of innovation in London. So uh, if you'd like us to communicate through your offices by, uh, you know, an email or questionnaires or uh, would be fantastic if we can get that response. I know Peter and I will also be keen to host some leaders of industry, but we're really looking at London. What is what is unique about London, and why, and what we can do through this mayor's commission in making it more attractive to uh, to to as you correctly point out, we have the brains, we have the science, uh, but I'm sure there are other things we can help with. So thank you on that note. Really, well, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. And, uh, and, uh, I think that making the commercial and the R&D link yes. real yes. is the key. Absolutely. And um, it's possible to do that in London. Yeah. So I hope, uh, I wish you success with your commission. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.